Virginia Holman with Island Wildlife. Today, I'm happy to introduce biologist Susan Campbell. Susan's been involved in research and education with a primary focus on birds for over 20 years. She's been the leading hummingbird researcher in North Carolina since 1999, and she's banded over 5,000 hummingbirds across the state. The majority of these have been ruby-throated, but over 300 have been Western species. Investigating wintering hummingbirds has been a particular interest since her early days as a staff member at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science in the early 1990s. And I've banned our overwintering hummingbird here in Carolina Beach. In addition to being a research affiliate with the museum, she is a seasonal naturalist for North Carolina State Parks. Susan is involved with research, education, and outreach at Weymouth Woods Sand Hills Nature Preserve and is a regular contributor to the Pilot Newspaper and Pine Straw and O. Henry magazines. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Virginia. It's great to, to be here. Wish we could be doing this in person, but um, I think this is definitely the next best thing. And it's always wonderful to talk about hummingbirds, no matter where I am or how we're, how we're doing it. So I hope people enjoy the presentation today. We don't have a lot of time to talk about this topic, unfortunately, but I will sh share with you basic information and we will have time for some questions. Um, it's very exciting to be talking about hummingbirds today because our ruby-throated hummingbirds, our breeding species of hummingbird, is on the way north. And yes, indeed, they've been seen across North Carolina in a smattering of locations already, including here in our yard outside of, of Raleigh just last night. We had our first male come by, um, so it is definitely time. For those of you there at the coast, of course, there are a lot of folks that are lucky enough to have hummingbirds 12 months a year now. And um, I, I envy that very much. And it is a topic that I am interested in. And I'll talk a little bit about that today, the wintering hummingbirds uh, along the coast. But we're gonna be focusing mainly on the ruby-throated and talking about my research and how this plays into to hummingbirds across North Carolina. So those of you who are tuning in from other parts of the state, I will be making some mention to, to other locations, not, not just the coast. Uh, but hummingbirds are near and dear to my heart. They are a group of birds that just fascinate so many people, even if they're not really bird watchers. Uh, I know people that maintain hummingbird feeders that don't really feed other birds, but boy, do they love their hummingbirds and they take very good care of their feeders and plant for them and just really, really connect with hummingbirds. And it's no wonder because they are so special. They are the only bird that can fly sideways, backwards, even upside down. Um, and they're the only birds that truly hover. But the thing that really captures people, I think, is the iridescence of their plumage, the beautiful colors. They are typically called flying jewels. And in the tropics have been regarded the status of gods in the past because of the fact that they are so marvelous and so unique. So it's no wonder you can get it really enamored with hummingbirds very quickly. And I'm sure that, that most of the folks tuning in today have experiences with them, probably have some very special moments with them. Um, but I wanna to try to just pass on some of the, the information that I'm sure um, a lot of you are interested in hearing about, and we'll talk about feeding some, um, talk about gardening very briefly. That's That would be an entirely different subject for another day uh, because there's a lot to be said about providing for hummingbirds in terms of planting for them. But we're gonna have basically a, 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 just an overview today uh, about hummingbirds in North Carolina. So here we go. Um, another marvelous thing about these tiny birds is that they live so close to us. They seem to pretty much disregard humans, uh, although I believe there, there are those individual hummingbirds that really do connect with us, that know somehow we have something to do with those sugar water feeders that are hanging around the yard. Um, but some of us are very lucky to have very up close and personal experiences with hummingbirds. And in the case of this photo here, this hummingbird had 
been trapped in a garage for a short period of time. It had flown in the door and couldn't find its way out. Um, probably some of you have had that experience where you end up with hummingbird trapped in your garage. And typically what happens is they're coming in looking for something that they see. They see a flash of red, which is their favorite color. They come in to investigate and then they can't figure out how to get out because hummingbirds, like all birds, will fly up to get away. And when they fly up in your garage, of course, they're going to encounter the ceiling and that's very confusing. Uh, so they may fly around for a time up high until they get tired. In the case of this little bird, she came down and was kind of tired and they were able to, to hold on to her for a few minutes before they took her outside and let her go. Um, often, quite frankly, hummingbirds, when they end up in a garage, are attracted to that little red knob on the emergency pull cord that's associated with an electric garage door opener. Maybe some of you have had this experience. Um, if you have, what I would suggest is putting some aluminum foil around that knob so that it doesn't attract them in and they get, get trapped. But they often will see other sorts of red objects in a garage and be attracted to them as well. But that knob typically is what causes them to come in. So for those of you who've had personal experiences with them, you are in the minority. Um, I feel very fortunate myself to be able to work with these birds up close. It is a privilege. It's one that I never tire of. And as Virginia said, I've been doing this since 1999. But every day, every year, I learn something new from these little birds. Because of the fact that they're so special, uh, and they require special training to work with. And I also have very special permits to work with hummingbirds. I have a state and a federal permit that allows me to work with these birds. So we use some very specialized techniques when we work with them um, because they are so, so different. Um, but at the same time, what I tell people who are interested in helping me is that um, it's it's really not so different from working song with songbirds. It's just working at a smaller scale. And I do have people that volunteer with me. I'm always on the lookout for volunteers that would like to help, especially during programs that I give. And I'm also on the lookout for people who have a serious interest that might be involved, interested in getting involved with our banding projects. Um, so if you think that you might be interested in getting involved with hummingbirds, and it is a, a commitment, it is a long-term commitment, but if you're interested, please let me know because these guys and gals are just are so special. They're so marvelous. And being able to work with them up close, you really do learn a lot. But the, the, the ultimate thing is I, I really have a lot of respect for what these little birds can do. Um, they've clearly been around longer than humans have been. We're just lucky enough to now, you know, to, to notice them and have ways of drawing them close to us by planting or by setting up feeders so that we can observe them uh, at close quarters. Okay. Yeah, the male ruby-throated is depicted here. He is the one with the bright red, full red throat or, or gorget, as we call it. The adult males are the ones that are showing up. Migrant males are showing up now. The adult males are migrating ahead of the females by about 10 days to two weeks. They are returning to North Carolina from Mexico and points south in Central America where they have spent the winter. They have been winging their way up here since sometime in February. Uh, the first ruby throated crossed the Gulf back into the United States at the very end of February. Uh, and it seems like they are really in a hurry this year. There are, as I said, there are birds showing up already. Typically, we don't think of them showing up in the Piedmont of North Carolina till, mid, till the first 10 days or so of April, but they seem to be a little ahead of schedule. And certainly they do take advantage of prevailing winds like our migrant birds of, of all kinds. So southerly winds are going to help bring them on their way uh, back to their breeding grounds. And the male ruby throated will be setting up breeding territories anywhere from North Florida all the way up through the eastern U.S. up into um, southeastern Canada. So they do have a very broad breeding range. They are the only species that breeds east of the Mississippi River. And here in North Carolina, we do literally have them from the mountains to the coast in the summer months. So the males return ahead of the females. They're going to be setting up a breeding territory somewhere that's very good primo hummingbird habitat. And then they will basically be waiting for the females to return. 
The females look very different than the males. They are just basically a green and white. They do have iridescent green feathers on their back, as you can see on the head of this female. Their dorsal surface is very green, so they blend in well with the vegetation. Their underparts are, are basically just a white or a grayish white. And this gives them an advantage when they're on the nest. They are very well, very well camouflaged. So the females will be returning behind the males. They will themselves look for a good spot to build a nest to raise their brood. Um, hummingbirds do not pair bond. They only get together in order to mate. The female will do all of the nest building the, and the brood rearing herself without any help from the male. So when she gets back and she gets down to the business of starting to build this nest, she will seek out a male for mating purposes. And she will be flying around looking for a male. She'll be looking and listening for a male. And when she enters a male's territory, he will notice her and begin displaying for her. And for ruby throated, that means he'll be doing a U-shaped pendulum swing in the air right in front of her face from side to side and you may hear him doing this because as he changes direction his wings will make a zinging sort of sound so it's a kind of a zing 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 that he'll be making in the air right in front of her and if she seems impressed or she doesn't fly away he'll get right in front of her and do a back and forth shuttle display and his feathers at that point will be making kind of a zipping noise, a zip, zip, zip as he flies back and forth in front of her. And if she she seems impressed, then he will attempt to mate with her, which is a very quick, very quick endeavor. And then she will be off on her way and he will essentially wait for the next female to come by. But the female makes this wonderful camouflage nest that's rather deep with soft materials like plant down and animal fur and that will protect as well as insulate the eggs and then the youngsters and the beauty of this nest not only is it camouflaged but it is made with spider webbing glued together with spider webbing and sometimes a little bit of plant sap but that spider webbing and you may see a little bit of it on the branch there that spider webbing is good glue but it also stretches so that as the youngsters grow, this nest will stretch with them because it's going to take a good two weeks for the, the eggs to hatch. And then the young are going to be in the nest for about another three weeks or so, maybe more. And those youngsters, and there are only two of them, that's all that will fit. Those youngsters get pretty big. And here you can see two youngsters that are still probably a week away from hatch of leaving the nest. But you see how that nest there at the at the the top of the nest is definitely stretching so that they are still contained in that nest. And you can see here these young are begging from the female and she is going to be feeding them uh, kind of a sword swallowing act. She'll be feeding them mostly regurgitated protein in the form of small insects, a little bit of a slurry with nectar or sugar water, um, but mainly protein because it's going to take a lot of protein for these youngsters to grow to the point where when they leave the nest, they're going to be virtually independent at that point. Yes, they, they don't stay with mom very long, if at all. They're going to be as big as she is, if not bigger, and they'll have all the instincts they need in order to survive at that point. So they will pretty much be ready to fend for themselves when they take that first flight from the nest. Here in North Carolina, our ruby-throated are... Uh, are lucky to have a long season. They will be able to raise two sets of young during the summertime. So when mama gets finished with her second, her first brood in, in a lot of places around um, the end of June, mid, mid to end of June, she will start a second nest. And, uh, and then by the time August rolls around, uh, the family rearing will be, will be winding down. But she will basically be busy with reproductive duties virtually the entire time she's here in North Carolina. Uh, that's a long, hard summer for a female. Um, she will be here into August. The males, however, uh, for them, summer will actually wind down in early July. They will be finishing up with um, mating with the females for the second time 
And by mid-July, their bodies will have turned off in terms of uh, breeding behavior. They will kind of loiter around in North Carolina for a while in July, but believe it or not, for the males, fall migration begins at the end of July. So they will be heading out in early July. They're the first ones to arrive. They'll be the first ones to leave. So, so the summer is going to be a very busy time, especially for these females. Um, and the young hummingbirds here in North Carolina will be around um, July into August. Uh, and when, when mid-August comes around, that's when we really start to detect a decrease in the number of, of ruby-throated. In the Piedmont, typically our peak is in the end of July, beginning of August. For those of you at the coast, um, it seems like the breeding peak is, is sooner than that. It may be the beginning of July when you notice that you're just absolutely covered up with hummingbirds. Those of us in the Piedmont and the mountains will, will notice that escalation in numbers um, at the end of July, beginning of August. Um, so it's, it's a little bit staggered depending on where in North Carolina you are. But we have plenty of hummingbirds around through Labor Day. But once September gets here, then we notice a, a gradual decline as our young of the year are leaving and as migrants are passing through. Um, as I said, these birds breed all the way up into Maine and into Canada. So we're going to have birds passing through for a good long time um, into October generally. We'll see our last migrants passing through, heading back to Mexico and Central America. Um, end of mid, actually mid, sometimes now end of October. It's later than it used to be when I first started doing this. The, the season for ruby throated used to run from mid-April to maybe the beginning of October, but that is definitely changing now. We have them around longer, and we think that probably... Uh, the climate changing has, has something to do with that. Um, but they definitely are migratory species. And for those of you at the coast, you've got your ruby throateds there that turn up that you notice November, December, January. Those are, as far as we know, in along the southern part of our coastline in North Carolina, those are migrants that are coming here to spend the winter from points north. They're not year-round individuals. We have documented some year-round, literally year-round activity on Hatteras Island, but that is the only place, as far as we know at this point, where there seems to be some year-round ruby-throated hummingbirds, um, which is, quite frankly, unprecedented and, and very exciting. Now, maybe that the more that we learn about these birds along the coastline down there in the Wilmington area, we may find that there's some of that going on there, too. But it doesn't surprise me that it's happening around Hatteras because that's the part of the state that really is the warmest year round, given the fact that it juts out and is mediated, moderated by the weather coming off the Gulf Stream. So by for us here around here in the Piedmont or maybe for you all, it's a little sooner. By mid-June, we've got young hummingbirds coming to our feeders and they show up looking a lot like their mothers. And here we have a young male. We know that because he's got a few red feathers in the middle of his throat already. But for the most part, he looks like his mama. He's green on the back. He's got white on the tips of his tail. He looks very different than he will as an adult the next spring. So these young males uh, may just have a few red feathers or they may just have a lot of black streaking in their throat where the red feathers will come in during the course of the next uh, eight months or so. You'll also see that this young male, he's got dusty looking feathers on his head, and that will happen not only from pollen getting on, on his head feathers as he visits flowers, but he also has feathers on his head that start out with little whitish or yellowish fringes on them, and those fringy feathers will wear smooth over the first month or so of his life, but the first few weeks that he's out and about out of the nest, he has this very dusty looking appearance. Also, the green iridescence that shows through in his green feathers on his back is going to be more of a, a bronzy color than an emerald green. And you can see that a little bit there on his shoulder. That green is uh, kind of yellowish. And also, these young hummingbirds will have quite often have some color on their flanks. You can see his flank is a little bit peachy colored there. Um, 
and that's not unusual. Young males and young female ruby throats will have some color, some wash on their flanks. Sometimes it's very noticeable, and when folks see that color, they wonder if they're seeing something other than ruby throated. Um, but when we have a conversation about it, it usually turns out, nope, it's just a young ruby throat. It's, it's not a different species. As I said, ruby throated are the only ones we expect during the breeding season. They're the only species that we know breeds east of the Mississippi. So we really don't expect to see other species of hummingbirds here in the summer. It does happen from time to time. And um, when something different shows up here, it's typically a bird whose, whose migratory path is, is off, maybe as a result of um, screwy hormones, maybe a result of weather. Uh, sometimes we have Western species that show up here during the summertime, but it is very unusual, very exciting when it happens, but it is very unusual. We really only expect to see ruby throated from April uh, through September um, every year. So our ruby throateds, um, they really do have requirements like other birds. They need shelter. So they're going to be looking for thick evergreen vegetation at night to roost in or to get out of the elements if there's some sort of storm. And we have so many different types of evergreens around here that will, will serve the purpose. Everything from our hollies to, to pines to cedars. Um, all kinds of different trees. You have live oak out there, which is great. One of the better hummingbird trees at the coast. Hummingbirds really seem to have an affinity for live oaks. But we have all kinds of evergreen vegetation that they will take advantage of for, for shelter. Um, in terms of natural food, they are going to be looking for nectar from brightly blooming flowers. And one that's very common, especially out towards the coast, are winter blooming um, sasanquas, and some of those do actually have nectar associated with them, so they will take advantage of something like a sasangua. And of course, the sasanquas, camellias, are evergreen, so they may use the shrubs as a form of cover in addition to feeding on nectar at the blooms. And now, of course, in the spring, we've got things blooming, including hummingbird plants. Here in North Carolina, we have wild coral honeysuckle, which is blooming now. Uh, certainly our Carolina jessamine, that is blooming like crazy. And here in the Southeast, we believe that the hummingbirds really use jessamine very heavily as they make their way north along their migratory route and take advantage of it as it's blooming as a very common common nectar source. But there are lots of sources of nectar out there that they will, that they will use in the spring and through the summer. Um, yes, red is a color they see easily. Bright colors are very visible to hummingbirds. They can see red half to three quarters of a mile away. Uh, so they definitely have evolved with some of these very brightly colored flowers. And tubular blooms tend to be the ones that they have an affinity for as well, probably because of the fact that their long tongue is the only one that can get down into these flowers to be able to reach the nectar. Um, so you will find that a lot of their favorite flowers are tubular and very brightly colored, whether they're native plants or non-native plants. One of the non-native favorites, in fact, probably at the top of the list for our hummingbirds, if you were to give them a choice, are the salvias or sages. And you can get a lot of different salvia species at garden stores these days. Um, some of them are very good perennials. Some of them are annuals that are actually worth planting every year. But there is such an array of salvias out there that, that they like. And the one that's depicted here, many of you may be familiar with, it's Brazilian sage. And this sage, Salvia guaranitica, has been bred in many different forms. So you may see a light blue variety of it, uh, which is called Argentine Skies. You may see the blue and black variety. Um, purple, Purple Majesty is one that's popular. Um, but it is one of this particular type of salvia, salvia guarnitica, Brazilian sage, in all its forms is one of the most popular. And you'll notice this one is not red, pink, or orange. It's blue. And the interesting thing about hummingbirds is even though they can see and are drawn to bright colors, they test out a variety of flowers. 
and even even white ones. And so they will find the sweet flowers and they will be drawn to them. And what we've learned about the salvias is that they don't necessarily produce nectar that's ultra sweet. They just produce a lot of nectar per bloom. The blooms on the Squarnitica may be open for two or three days during the course of the summer months, but while it's open, it produces a lot of nectar. So it's a lot of bang for the buck. And that's, we think, why the birds are really drawn to, to this Guaranitica. Moving along. But I already alluded, alluded to this. Hummingbirds actually eat mainly insects. Um, yes, we don't typically see them feeding on bugs, but they do. And this little bird here is watching from a perch, is watching for insects. They will, like flycatchers, sit on a perch, watch for insects, and fly out and grab them out of the air. But they are also, of course, very adept at finding insects in vegetation, whether it's in the flowers that they visit or just in thicker vegetation. They will look in the bark, under the leaves, and look for insects. The insects that they eat are anything small enough to fit down the hatch, whether it's spiders, mites, aphids, all kinds of invertebrates are hummingbird food. And because of that fact, it is very important to keep in mind that if you want to provide for hummingbirds and maintain a, a healthy environment for hummingbirds, we want to use as little chemical on the landscape as possible. They need those insects. And unfortunately, there is a host of pesticides as well as herbicides that are a real problem for our insect populations. And there are places where we're seeing dramatic declines in insects, and this cannot be good for the hummingbirds. So the A number one thing that you can do for them above and beyond feeding them with flowers or sugar water is to really enhance the native insect population or at least support the insect population for them. Because if the bugs aren't there, the hummingbirds won't be there or they won't be there for very long. And uh, if you've never seen a hummingbird actually catching an insect, this is a good, good shot of that. Their vision, yes, their vision is very good. Um, their hearing and their vision is very good. And their sense of taste is quite good. Um, what they're looking for, I didn't say this, but what they're looking for in terms of sweetness is about a 30% sugar concentration, whether it's a flower or a feeder, that's what they're looking for in terms of an energy, uh, the energy that, that they are, are needing in terms of sweetness. But most of the time they are out there looking for insects and the females need lots and lots of tiny bugs to raise those two youngsters. Um, and then the adult birds, they need lots of insects every day in addition to that pick me up of, of sugar water or, or nectar. So yeah, it, it's fun that we can attract these birds by planting or by hanging hummingbird feeders. And this is a very, very popular activity. Every year, I think I see more feeders on the market and, and other things for people interested in, in attracting hummingbirds. Um, and it is wonderful that we can attract them so close to us that we can, we can watch them. Um, but you know, I get questions all the time about why are they so aggressive? Why, what can I do about this? And this is a good photo here from a friend of mine out near Manio who had these two young males. You can see the one down there below. He's got a few feathers in his gorget. Um, these are two young males that were fighting at his feeders. And this went on for about 25 minutes one day. And the two of them actually ended up on, on the ground together wrestling, um, which is not a good thing. Hummingbirds don't, don't do well on the ground. They, they have a hard time getting up off the ground because their little legs are not very strong. Their, their feet are built for perching and that's about it. Um, if you're gonna have feeders, you're going to notice that these birds are going to be aggressive. Um, I, I tell people, well, you know, put up, put up more feeders. If you wanna reduce the, uh, the aggression, you can put up more feeders, but hummingbirds are just aggressive by nature. They are territorial, especially around food sources. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a male or a female, if it's a young male or an adult male, they are all very aggressive. It's just in their nature. But generally, when they're being aggressive, it's it's bluffing. Uh, they typically don't hurt one another. They don't even usually make contact with one another. Um, oftentimes, it's just their chattering. 
or their body language that that makes their point so that they they don't typically hurt one another when they're having these altercations. I'll talk a little bit about feeders because it is good to be aware of the fact that in the bird feeding industry, unfortunately, there aren't regulations when it comes to what's safe and what works. It's something that you have to pretty much figure out on your own and be aware that you can't believe everything that you read when it comes to bird products and hummingbird feeders are no exception. Um, there are hummingbird feeders on the market that don't work very well. There are hummingbird feeders on the market that are impossible to get clean. And if that's the case, then you don't want you don't want to own one of those because it really is critical that you keep your feeder clean. The feeders will grow molds and fungus that are dangerous to the birds. So unless you have a feeder that you can keep clean, there's no point there's no point owning one. And unfortunately, yes, there are feeders on the market and oftentimes they're very inexpensive. Um, there are feeders on the market that you cannot really get clean. Um, so you really need to be careful and do your homework. Now, the nice thing is that these days there are some feeders on the market that are very easy to keep clean, that are very safe for the birds. That's the other thing. Some of the feeder designs out there are not safe. Either the ports are too small or the perches are in the wrong place. Um, so keep in mind, yes, there are feeders now on the market that are very good feeders that don't cost a lot, but that are safe and that are easy to clean. The model I'm showing here is probably one a lot of you are familiar with because it's been around a long time. It's the Perky Pet Four Fountain Feeder. Um, the feeder that's that I'm showing you here doesn't have the bee guards on it. I typically don't use the yellow bee guards on my hummingbird feeders unless I really have to, unless it's later in the summer. I like to give the birds a lar nice large port to feed from um, so that it reduces the possibility of bill injury. So this feeder here, I've got the, got the bee guards out. I've had my Perky Pet 4 Fountain out all winter for, um, for the birds here in hopes of attracting a winter hummingbird this year, which unfortunately I didn't. Um, but during the summer, and as last night when our male showed up, he showed up at this feeder, um, just use that feeder, um, but without the bee guards on it. Above the feeder, you'll see that I have an ant moat. Ant moats are pretty much a necessity in North Carolina. 12 months of year, we, can ha we have ants that will find sugar water. So using that cup above the feeder with water in it is going to act as a barrier so that the ants don't get into my feeder. Um, it's a good idea to use an ant moat. You don't want to be using sticky stuff like Vaseline or salad oil on that, that hanger. Um, you don't want to be using anything sticky around the feeder because the hummingbirds can do bump into that. And uh, if it's not water soluble, they're not going to be able to get it off their feathers. So using an ant moat is a much safer way to go. We have feeders these days that have built in ant moats which is which is great. Uh, but when you're looking at hummingbird feeders, there are two different types. There's going to be the reservoir style feeder, like what I'm showing you here, where the food is above uh, the feeding ports. So it's going to be drawn into the, the feeding ports by gravity. And this Perky Pet for Fountain is one that the birds really like. I think it's probably because the way that the perch is oriented, it's just at the perfect, the perfect size ratio for a ruby-throated. Um, and also they can feed without putting their head down. They can watch for predators and competitors as they feed. They're not vulnerable to attack from above. Um, but this feeder, not only does it seep and drip, and that's why I won't use it late in the summer. I tend to use it in the winter and the early season because um, it will attract bees and wasps by virtue of the fact that it, it, it can seep and drip. Um, but the birds really like it. Also, it's got a number of parts to clean, so it's not an easy feeder to keep clean. Reservoir style feeder that is easy to clean is this feeder here. It's the only feeder out there, reservoir style feeder out there that is going to be insect proof. This is the Dr. JB's clean feeder, and it basically has that reservoir up top and then the base comes apart in two pieces. So you only have three pieces to clean 
very easy to clean. It has that wide mouth on the reservoir, so it's easy to clean and easy to refill. Um, it's also made out of rubberized plastic. It is going to stand up to the elements very well. Um, so I use this feeder pretty heavily during the heat of the summer. Another beauty to this is that the Dr. JABs comes with interchangeable larger reservoirs. So as much as this is the two cup original style, you can get an interchangeable reservoir up to uh, 64 ounces to use with this feeder if you have a lot of hummingbird activity. But most of us don't don't have to worry about that. Um, even for me in the middle of the summer, um, I'm not even filling this feeder up all the way um, because I don't want to put too much food in there. I don't, um, I'm, I'm cleaning my feeder about every three days and that's what you need to do once it gets hot and humid above 80 degrees. You want to be cleaning this every few days. So I'm only putting in there what the birds are going to drink in three days, three, four days. Um, you need to clean it regularly when the weather gets hot or else you're going to have stuff growing in the liquid as i said which can set your birds up for a toxic situation and when you clean your feeders you want to be just using hot water you can use a 10 percent bleach solution every now and then but you don't want to use soaps because soaps and detergents will adhere to the plastic parts of your feeder and the birds can taste that and they really don't like it what's happening also, out there Also, you want to use just sugar and water um, when you're making your nectar, not store-bought mixes. I really don't, I don't recommend that. Just use a four to one water to sugar solution, four parts water, one part sugar to fill your feeder with. So it's very basic, very simple if you're gonna maintain feeders. The easiest feeder on the market to deal with though would be this, the Humzinger saucer style. Saucer style feeders have the food in the base. They're not going to seep or drip. Very easy to just pop open and clean. And they also have a built in ant moat. In this picture, you can see a little Carolina mantid looking down at the feeder. Um, praying mantises do get drawn to hummingbird feeders, typically to the insects that may be buzzing around. Um, Chinese mantids, which are a good bit bigger than this little Carolina mantid. Um, they can actually prey on hummingbirds and uh, so I suggest if you see mantids around your feeder to carefully with gloves on because they will bite <laughs> move them away so that they don't try to catch your hummingbirds. Um, hummingbirds are typically susceptible to predation in the nest not so much um, as adults uh, although sometimes they're known to get caught by things like uh, sharp-shinned hawks um, and they can actually be caught by cats, unfortunately. So you want to be sure your feeder is out of the way of any kind of cat activity. If you do have cats roaming around in your area, keep them up high so the birds aren't in danger of being, being caught. Um, but typically hummingbirds are most vulnerable to predators in the nest, anything from blackbirds um, to maybe a climbing snake. Um, it, it is possible, but predators have a hard time catching those fast moving adults who are flying around it on the order of 35 miles an hour. If you have hummingbird feeders up, you may attract other species um, like Orioles, especially out there in the in the Wilmington area. We have wintering Orioles, Baltimore Orioles, sometimes even Western Tanagers show up at, at sugar water feeders. Um, and then I've, I've had friends have warblers show up at their sugar water. Virginia had an orange ground warbler at her sugar water couple winters ago. Um, this is a yellow-throated warbler that was using a, sh a hummingbird feeder in uh, at Lake Madame Mesquite a few years ago. So sometimes when you present sugar water, especially in the winter, you'll have different sorts of guests. Here in our yard, we have chickadees and, and house finches that use the sugar water in the wintertime. So it's not just hummingbirds. It can be fun to see who gets attracted to your feeders, especially during the winter. It may not just be hummingbirds. A little bit about my research. Um, I am not only involved with documenting hummingbirds in North Carolina through emails and photographs that I get from people, but I, I do work with these birds and put uh, bands on them. I have the training and the permits, again, to do this work. And I typically use a, a trap to catch hummingbirds, like, like this one that's baited, basically, with a, with a feeder. 
And I just hold the door open and wait for a bird to go into the feeder. And then it's a matter of just dropping, dropping that door, reaching in through the side, through one of the smaller doors on the side to take the bird out. And the banding and processing of a hummingbird goes by very quickly. I'm typically only handling the bird for about 15 minutes to get the information that I need. But the most important part is putting this little unique number letter combination aluminum band on their legs so I know, know exactly who they are if I catch them again. It's kind of like a social security number. No two birds have the same combination. Uh, very similar to a, a songbird or a waterfowl band, except that instead of being engraved, it's, it's laser printed with the numbers um, instead of being, being engraved. So that's what the little bracelet looks like. It's very lightweight. It doesn't doesn't bother the bird at all. It can move around the bird's leg, but it's not going to come down over the foot. And it's like wearing a wristwatch. It's really insignificant weight. So they don't even know that they've got this little band on. But I've got the band on and I can gather the information about the bird. Um, and we've learned a lot about sight fidelity and movements of ruby-throateds um, through banding work. Um, also in the wintertime when I'm out banding, I see some pretty special stuff. Um, this is a Ruby throated going through wing molt, which is something that uh, goes on in the wintertime. But unless you're down in Mexico or Central America, you might not know about it. But um, my work catching wintering hummingbirds, I, I see this molt going on in January. Um, and it's documenting this. And a lot of the, the wintering ecology is pretty exciting because there are very few people that are working on hummingbirds during the wintertime. So for me, as much as I love seeing them during the breeding season the winter is when things get really interesting um, but seeing them up close is the only way that i can document these sorts of details so it's uh it's pretty exciting um year round to to work with with hummingbirds and be able to see them up close another thing that happens in the summer that i'm involved with documenting are white hummingbirds this one's a full albino full albinos are very rare with the pink bill and the red eye um, typ more typically what I see are whitish hummingbirds that have some white feathering, um, but that are not fully white like this. And it's interesting because they all turn out to be female. Um, somehow in hummingbirds, it may be that this is, seems to be a sex linked trait. Um, documenting white birds is, is interesting. One of the things that we know about white feathers is that they're very brittle. And this may help explain the fact that we've never seen one of these white hummingbirds um, adults. We've never seen one in the spring. We only see it in young birds in the late summer or fall. Um, last year, we had a, an albino that hung around in North Carolina well into November. Don't know if that bird ended up migrating or not, um, but it was, it was another one of our very interesting research subjects. And I'm always waiting to hear about a white hummingbird in the late summer. Um, because it, it is something that's not common, but there's, I hear about at least a couple of them every year, and I try to get out to them to ban them, um, but oftentimes, because it's migration in the late summer and fall, I may not be able to get there in time, and the bird will, will move on before I can get a chance to study it. But um, white hummingbirds are another thing that's definitely a much, a very much of an interest to me. But here as winter's winding down, I'll just mention um, my winter research. When you think about hummingbirds in, in the winter time, it just doesn't seem logical. But when you know that there are other small birds out there, like this ruby crowned kinglet that spend the winter in North Carolina, you realize, especially along the coast where the weather's warmer, that yeah, maybe hummingbirds can, can really make a go of it. And, and they do. Um, the ruby crown kinglet in this picture, they don't typically use feeders. You might see one at a suet feeder every now and then, but we have thousands of these little ruby crown kinglets across the state in the wintertime, and they are feeding on small insects, just like our hummingbirds do. So it's kind of an indicator that we have small insects here in North Carolina in abundance, even during the colder months. The hummingbirds that we typically see, especially inland, whoops, are Rufus hummingbirds. It's a western species of hummingbird that we now know comes and spends the winter here in, in the southeastern U.S. Uh, to some degree every winter. And this winter we had lots of Rufus hummingbirds. We probably had on the order of about about 80 that I heard about. Um, we did get out and, and banned about a third of those this winter. Um, 
And this is the adult male. Looks nothing like a ruby-throated. He is rusty red with a, an orangey, shiny orangey gorget. Um, these are hummingbirds that are very cold adapted. They breed up into Alaska, believe it or not, on the West Coast. But there is a portion of the population that flies to North Carolina and the rest of the Southeast every year. And this past winter, we had a lot of these visitors here with us. This is what a female looks like. She looks quite similar to our young male ruby-throated. Uh, female rufous do have some color in their throat and they have this color along their flanks and in their face and they tend to get more of the color on them as they get older. This female was I believe at least three years old and you can see she's got a band on her leg. She's one of the banded ones uh, that I've studied in the winter time and um, very neat little birds but they're very tough. They can handle cold weather no problem, um, even snow, even ice if it's not too bad. Um, and we've we found these hummingbirds in parts of the state, even in the western part of the state, even when there are no feeders around. They've got it figured out. They know how to survive during the cold, even in the absence of feeders. But if there's a feeder, that's even better. And with a rufus, it, uh, it's, it's something that involves very close scrutiny. I cannot definitively ID a female or young rufous hummingbird without looking at its tail feathers. And here you see the nippled tail feather that tells me that this bird is definitely, uh, it's probably a female, that it's definitely a rufous. Um, otherwise, I can't tell whether or not it might be an Allen hummingbird. This is an Allen hummingbird from the summer from Charlotte. Um, she's an adult Allen. She's very colorful. I was very, very surprised to find her. She was using feeders that a, a rufous female was also using. Um, so it was very cool in this neighborhood to find both of this gal and, and the rufous female kind of hanging out together. Um, the Allens is a hair bit smaller, not thought to be as migratory as rufous, but they do show up and we've had Allen hummingbirds in North Carolina um, before. We've just not had very many of them, um, but it's a matter of scrutinizing every hummingbird that looks like it might be a rufous or an Allens to be able to separate them. Adult male Allens look different. They have a green back. Um, they aren't the rufous all over like a, a male rufous, but the females are extremely similar and absolutely require me to look at them and look at those tail feathers really closely to be able to, to sort them out. So winter hummingbird work and looking at these, these rufous allens hummingbirds up close is a big part of, of what I do, especially inland. Um, that's just her, her gorget. Very colorful. Like I said, she's was an adult female Allen, so she was she was quite colorful. Another species that will show up in North Carolina in the winter every year, just about every year, and I found plenty of them in the Wilmington area as well as inland, is a black-chinned hummingbird. This is an adult male. They are very closely related to ruby throats, but they have a black throat bordered by purple. Um, the adult males, fairly easy to sort out. Um, but when it comes to females, they look virtually identical to female ruby throated. And it takes, again, takes me having them in hand usually to be able to sort them out. The differences are very minute. But like I said, we've had black chins spend the winter in the Wilmington area. I've caught and banded a number of them there, and I'm sure they get mixed in with the ruby throats um, and don't even get identified. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's happening every, every year. But in addition to rufous and black chinned, we have had um, eight other species of hummingbird here, western species of hummingbird in the winter. Um, and some of those have just been, just been once. Some of them like Anna's hummingbird. We've had Anna's hummingbirds here, a number of them over the years. Um, so we do get other Western species show up and they get mixed in um, with the wintering rufus and, and ruby throats that, that we'll find in North Carolina. But the season for that's winding down. A lot of our wintering rufus that I banded um, or that we've documented this winter have already headed back west. I imagine the black chins are, are doing the same thing. I'm aware of only one black chin that's still here, but they are heading out and getting replaced by our summer ruby throated. Um, I will just say that if anybody wants tips on, on feeding winter hummingbirds, there are not only lots of ideas about heating your feeder so that when it gets particularly cold, um, the food stays thawed, but there are also now commercial feeder heaters like this one on the market. So that it's pretty easy to, to keep your feeders going in the winter time 
Uh, but for those of you at the coast, you typically don't have too many mornings where it's below 27 degrees, where it's cold enough that your feeder is going to be in danger of, of freezing. But for those in the, the Piedmont and the mountains, there are a multitude of ways, including these commercial heaters that are now available so that it makes feeding hummingbirds in the winter um, even easier than it, uh, it used to be. We've pretty much run ourselves out of time. Um, and so I, I just wanna mention, um, if you wanna know more about my research, uh, you can get in contact with me. We also do have a Facebook page, um, North Carolina Hummingbirds Facebook page. There is the website through the Museum of Natural Sciences. If you search North Carolina Hummingbirds, you'll find our website at the, the museum. Also, we have a new website that's in process right now that's not quite finished. Uh, that's going to be an even better resource than the museum website. So we've got a lot of things going on right now. Um, if you want to know more, you can certainly reach out. Uh, you can Google Google it. You can contact me directly. I have no problem with that. My email address is right here, susan at ncavs.com. Um, I have no problem with, with folks reaching out or Certainly would love to hear from you if you have something unusual in the hummingbird department, if you attract a white hummingbird or if you have a winter hummingbird. Um, winter hummingbird does constitute a hummingbird that's on site between November 1st and March 15th, November 1st to March 15th. So, so next year, if you have hummingbirds in the winter or if you had hummingbirds this winter, I'd love to know about that so I can make you part of our, our database in North Carolina. Um, all good, good and important stuff. Uh, so with that, I would like to, to be able to take a few questions before we completely run out of time. That was great, Susan. Thank you so much. That was, that was wonderful. Um, we have a few questions coming in the chat here. Nancy asks, she says she has read that the yellow bee guards actually attract bees. Is that true? Yes, it is definitely true. Um, you, you will find now that a lot of these feeder manufacturers who include bee guards, and quite frankly, the bee guards, when it comes to reservoir style feeders, except for the Dr. J's, when it comes to reservoir style feeders, those bee guards aren't completely effective. They'll keep bumblebees and maybe honeybees out of your feeder, but there'll be smaller bees or yellow jackets that can squeeze through them. Um, Anyway, if you've got bee guards on a feeder these days, um, more likely those bee guards are going to be red than they're going to be yellow because yellow, yes, it does attract bees and uh, bees and wasps both. Um, so definitely uh, look for a feeder with with red bee guards or red feeding ports and you'll have less trouble with bees and wasps. Wonderful. We have a couple of questions related to cleaning. Uh, I'm going to put them together. One was asking um, how you should clean your feeders and another was asking how often you should clean your feeders when the temperature is below 80 degrees. Okay. Below 80 degrees, I would say clean them on a weekly basis. That's what I'm doing right now um, because you'll have less build up in your feeder, it's, it's, it's safe, especially if you've got some shade around your feeder. But once it gets hotter, once it's above 90 and it's humid, and if your feeder is in direct sunlight most of the day, you'll want to clean it three, every three to four days. Mm -hmm. And the way that I typically do this is I take my feeder apart and use very hot water. And I'll use uh, a bottle brush. I will say that for anybody that nowadays has the metal drinking straws that are very popular, best way to, to drink your drink without plastic, um, those metal drinking straw sets tend to come with a little brush that you can use for cleaning the straws. That little brush works like a charm with your hummingbird por ports. And so I have a spare one of those brushes that I use for my hummingbirds to get the nooks and crannies clean in and around the feeding ports. Otherwise, I just use very hot water. Um, like I said, a 10% bleach solution, especially later in July and August, something that I will use, um, a dilute bleach, bleach solution, just to make sure that the feeder is nice and clean. And I will use that with my feeders when I put a lot of them away for the winter. 
uh, just to make sure everything is 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 clean. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, you know, when you put sugar water into that feeder, as soon as you refill it, you know, you're, you're, you're not creating, you're keeping the feeders clean, but there's no way to really truly sterilize your feeder. Um, you want to just make sure that you're in a routine so that you keep it as clean as possible. Um, soaps do adhere to plastic and just about every feeder's got some plastic associated with it. So you just want to use hot water um, and the bleach. Vinegar is probably okay. I know there are folks that will use vinegar and that is probably okay. Anything vinegar or bleach, you want to make sure you really rinse the feeder very well. I will say that if there should be any bleach residue on your feeder when you've finished cleaning it, um, keep in mind it's interesting. That bleach will be rendered inert by the sugar solution. There is a chemical reaction that takes place. So you don't have to worry, although you want to make sure you rinse as much bleach as you can out of the feeder and get it nice and, and rinsed off. Um, you don't have to worry so much about that as you would having soap residue in a feeder if you clean it a conventional way. Terrific. Elizabeth wants to know how high should a feeder be from the ground and does it need to be away from trees by any particular distance? You can hang your feeder wherever you want to. And I mean, honestly, for most of us, when we hang feeders, it's for our enjoyment so that we can see the birds. Um, so putting them wherever you can see them and enjoy them is, is really what you want to do. But I will say that the higher the feeder is off the ground, the most likely the more popular it's going to be. The hummingbirds seem to be more attracted to feeders that are higher up. But if they're hung, you know, off a fairly tall shepherd's crook, that's fine. A lot of people hang them um, in their porches from the ceiling of the porch or, you know, right at the edge of the porch. That's that's fine. But if you're on a if you have a second floor or you're in an apartment or something like that, having your feet are hung hung high up is may actually attract more birds and attract birds more quickly. Um, but hanging them wherever you can enjoy them is is important. Now, if you're somebody that wants to attract more hummingbirds and you love, you know, you love your hummingbirds and you want to attract as many as you can, you want to hang a, typically a cluster of feeders because what will happen is you will have an, a single hummingbird that will try to defend your feeder at some point during the summer. Sometimes early in the season, this doesn't happen so much as later. Um, but you will find at some point you'll have somebody that's trying to defend that feeder. But if you have multiple feeders hung up in the same location, one bird's not going to be able to defend um, multiple feeders. And that will get the attention. Multiple feeders will get the attention of more hummingbirds in the area. Like I said, they're very visual. Um, so it really doesn't matter where you hang them. If it's from a tree or from the house or from a shepherd's crook, um, the birds will find them because their vision is, is so good. That's wonderful. And, and sort of a related question, Barbara is asking, how high up in evergreens do female hummers build their nests? Oof. Unfortunately, it can be quite high. Um, hummingbird nests have been documented 60, 80 feet off the ground. Um, that's what makes them so very hard to find, that and the fact that they're so well camouflaged. Also, they tend to be out towards the end of a branch where the branch is sort of down sloping, harder for a predator to get to that nest. Mm -hmm. So yes, they're hard to see and hard to find, and often that's because they are quite high up. Uh, John is asking, Susan, do you recommend playing hummingbird sounds to help draw hummingbirds? That very well may work. I have not tried it. Um, I will say that when I'm doing my banding and if I'm having trouble trapping a particular hummingbird, I will use a decoy. Um, and that works well for my purposes in, in trying to attract um, hummingbirds into my trap. But uh, because of the fact that they are attracted to each other by sound as well, playing hummingbird sounds, chattering sounds, and hummingbirds, although they don't sing, they, they use body language and they use their feathers to communicate. They don't have a, a singing apparatus. They do make noises indeed. Um, and a lot of chittering and chattering 
as well as the sound that they make with their wings is something that they all do cue into. So that might very well be a help to getting a few birds attention is, is to play some sounds. I'll have to try that myself. That's an interesting thought. Very good. It looks like we have a couple of people with their hands raised. I think Judith had her hand raised and had a question. Judith, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Let's see. Um, I, I wanted to know the, the, I didn't catch the name of the feeder that, that she um, recommended. Okay. The doctor okay. somebody. Yes, that would be Dr. J is in John, B is in boy. J, Dr. J B's clean feeder. Um, that is the name of the feeder. Dr. J B Whalen invented the feeder. He's actually a radiologist from Charlotte, North Carolina, and it, his feeder has become quite a sensation. In fact, he had to sell the bit couldn't keep up. Um, so, Dr. J B's clean feeder is the name of the feeder that I mentioned. Okay. Terrific. Thank you very much. I think Jen was asking, is there a South Carolina hummingbirds counterpart to your work? Um, yes, there is. Dr. Bill Hilton um, is a hummingbird researcher in South Carolina. Um, he is but these days, because he's had some health issues, he he's mainly doing his research on his property. He doesn't do the traveling that he used to, um, but Dr. J Dr. Bill Hilton is the one uh, to check out. He has a wonderful website, Hilton Pond um, mm -hmm. website, and he would be the South Carolina counterpart. I do have some colleagues that do winter banding down there as well, but as far as I know, they're not uh, as involved with education as as I am, but they are involved on the, on the research front. A couple folks scattered around the state. Um, Jill Pelusis is asking, well, she's saying great program, Susan, and it was, um, where do most of our wintering hummingbirds nest, Virginia and Maryland or farther north? Huh. Wow, I wish I could answer that question. Um, unfortunately, none of our winter banded ruby throats have been recaptured on the breeding grounds yet. Um, and this probably has to do with the fact that it's it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, so many ruby throated, you know, breed up north. And there are some hummingbird banders up there, but not enough to be able to have really good odds of recapturing our wintering birds here in North Carolina. Um, for me, with our ruby throated, my best odds for, for catching, recatching a banded bird are going to be catching one of mine in a location where I regularly regularly band each breeding season or likewise where I regularly band in the winter. Um, I wish I knew, but I will say one thing about our winter ruby throated. They are lar larger body size wise in the, in the range of sizes. Um, and this is something that was discovered by my mentor who was banding hummingbirds up here ahead of me, Dr. S I mean, Bob Sargent. We find that the coastal ruby throated that are here with us in the winter are larger. And this means, this leads us to believe that those birds are coming here from the northern reaches of the breeding grounds. And so it leads us to believe that these may be the birds that are, that are breeding up into Canada, up into northern New England and up into Canada. But we don't know for sure yet, yet. That's great. Um... Wilson Laney is asking, will hummingbirds eat the bees and the wasps? No, unfortunately. Um, they, like this antagonistic shot that I'm showing here, was, uh, was a lucky shot taken by a photographer in North Raleigh, and it actually won a number of competitions. John Stroud um, was a beginner ph hummingbird photographer when he captured this shot, and I think the hummingbird here is just antagonizing that, that honeybee. Um, way too large for it to swallow. Um, so hummingbirds are really going after smaller things. They may go after, if we have some extremely small bees and wasps, maybe, but I don't know that there are any that are small enough. Hummingbirds certainly will be eating very small flies um, in addition to other invertebrates, 
But again, it has to be something small enough to, to fit down the hatch. They, they don't have teeth, so they can't choose. So whatever they eat has got to, got to be something that they eat whole. Very good. Scrolling down for a second. Carlton says that they've heard that some hummingbird feeders have ports where a hummingbird can actually get its beak stuck and break off as it tries to fly away. Is this true? Yes, unfortunately, it is true. Um, and that's why if you if you see any hummingbird feeders out there with slits or very tiny holes, mm -hmm. uh, you want to steer clear of those. And there are manufacturers that have have done this in their infinite wisdom. They think, you know, that this is a good idea because by making the opening very small, the bees and wasps won't be so much of a problem. And in actuality, that's that's not really true. The bees and the wasps will still be attracted to the seeping nectar. Um, but when the hummingbirds try to feed, if they get their bill in that hole, not just their tongue, but their bill, there is the risk of injury. And it is very real. I've, I've seen birds with bill abrasions. And I know of situations where there have been birds that have actually broken their bills uh, and that's that's very bad news okay uh, someone in Raleigh C CSR in Raleigh is asking if it is okay to hang the feeders near other types of bird feeders yes it's totally fine um, the hummingbirds really won't take much notice of the songbirds um, it, it, it typically isn't an issue. So yeah, you can hang a hummingbird feeder from the same crook where you've got your suet and your seed feeders. That's that's really not a problem at all. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question or not. Someone was, here, let me let me pivot over to Richard and Sue who have their, their hand raised. Richard yes. and Sue. Thank you very much. We've uh, significantly enjoyed the uh, presentation. It was really terrific. Uh, one question about the hummingbird uh, lifespan. Uh, how long do they typically live? They typically live three to five years on average. Um, however, most hummingbirds, and this is it's kind of a hard fact, but most of the young of the year don't make it to their first birthday. We think there's about a 90% mortality rate. but in songbirds, it's about the same, especially migrant birds. That first year is very hazardous. So the vast majority of them don't make it to their first birthday. Once they make it to their first birthday, then their odds of surviving beyond that are much better once they have the experience. That having been said, believe it or not, there are two different female ruby-throateds that were banded and recaptured at over the age of seven. So that's, you know, that's really impressive. Even three to five years is impressive for a bird that's not much bigger than an insect. Um, but yeah, we typically think of them living uh, three to five years. So, you know, you're in your yard, you may have the same, some of the same hummingbirds coming back year after year. You'll probably have individuals that are related in your area. Um, as well. So there is that possibility that you do have, at least for a time, some of the same birds coming back to your yard summer after summer. Good, thank you. And Wilson is asking if we could list the, the museum address. Are you, uh, are, are you doing work affiliated with the Museum of Natural oh, Sciences? I, my, yeah, my affiliation has been with the museum as a research affiliate for some time. Um, and that has really afforded me just um, the ability to not only use museum resources, um, but I also work through the museum with the website and the nonprofit fund that I have right now is, is through the museum for folks who want to donate and get that nonprofit uh, benefit. Um, also, it helps me when I am in places around the state where folks don't know me, it mm -hmm. uh, it really lends some you know some credence to my reputation that I am affiliated with the museum, and I have been since I started doing this work. Um, and so there is that 
there is that direct connection. And I do work with, with John Gerwin, who is the, who is the head of birds at the, at the museum. And we do exchange information quite regularly. And um, so that is, that is the work that I do with the museum. I'm not on the museum payroll, but the work that I'm doing like other research affiliates is, is directly connected to the museum. And there is a, a very um, uh, formal relationship with them. Great. Well, well, we'll make sure to, to list the museum when we send the recording out to everyone as well. I think that may be all of the questions. I'm scrolling. Great down here. Uh, Wonderful. We do have one hand from Sarah. You have a hand from Sarah. Okay. I think you need to unmute yourself, Sarah. Yes, I do. Okay. I um, This is the first year for me in this area, and I have a question about storing the, mix, the sugar and water mixture. Is it safe to store it in the refrigerator between feeding, between filling the feeders? Yes. Sugar and water in your refrigerator should last up to two weeks. If you put it in a pitcher or some kind of container, um, up to two weeks, it, it should be fine. I know people also that will make small jars of it and put it in the freezer that don't need a lot of capacity at any one time. And so they'll actually freeze it in small containers and you can you can freeze it and have it be just fine for, you know, three months or more. So, oh, awesome. yes, it's perfectly good. Thank you. This has been an awesome seminar. Thank you. Great. This this has been been great. And I believe there's someone, Susan, who works at the museum and wants to get in touch with you about teaching a hummingbird class for children. She's teaching a hummingbird class for children next week. And sure. like to get in touch well, I'd, with I'd love to hear from anyone. I right now am um we're we're doing it, it's gonna be kind of late, but we're working out the schedule for programs, in-person programs this summer. I am going to be doing some in-person programs, given that things are improving with COVID, some outdoor programs, some uh, demonstration type programs around the state. So stay tuned about that. I will announce them on the Facebook page as they get scheduled. There is a chance I may be at Airly Gardens in June, but we're still not certain of that yet. Um, so stay tuned if you want an opportunity to come out and see us in person. Our summer programs will always be advertised on the Facebook page. This, this was fantastic. I think we had one more question. Uh, someone's asking if it's safe to use the pre-made pre perky pet or other um, food. I imagine that has red dye in it. Uh, yeah, yeah. the, the pre-packaged mixes, not all of them. Some of them are just... Are they? fancy packages of sugar and in those cases um you know if you want to if you feel the need to buy you know spend some extra money buying um just sugar in a fancy package that's fine but a lot of these pre-packaged mix mixes including perky pet not only may they have color in them a lot of them do have red food coloring but some of them they often have preservatives and additives that are of questionable efficacy um and I will tell you that the birds can taste those preservatives and they may not consume that store-bought nectar. I've, mm -hmm. I've seen that happen. I've seen it happen. Um, so it's best not to use those mixes and just stick to sugar and water because we know that is safe. Um, mm -hmm. I will say that when hummingbirds have been consuming store-bought mixes with red dye and I'm handling them, I know about it because they can't digest that dye. They will poop and pee red. And I often can see red around their vent when I'm working with them because they've gotten stained from, um, from consuming that dye. Red food coloring is typically a petroleum-based byproduct. And it is something that the birds really can't digest. I've been told that it gets, some of it will get stored in their fat cells. This has been something that's been studied to some degree. Um, so it doesn't metabolize well and they do not digest it well. So it's very possibly a, a bad thing for them. Uh, there are rehabbers and others that insist that it may be cancer causing in hummingbirds. But all I can say is above anything, 
it is totally unnecessary to have red coloring in sugar water. They can see that sugar water, they can see the feeder, given that just about every feeder out there has got red on it. They can see that feeder. They don't need color in the liquid. And I can guarantee you the nectar they're drinking from flowers is, is clear. So I would stay away from the store-bought mixes. They really are expensive when you think about it. Um, so just stick with sugar and water and you know you'll be doing the right thing for your birds. And that's four, four parts water to one part sugar? Exactly. Okay, very good. Well, Susan, this has been great. Thank you all so much. If anyone Thank you. any further questions, you can make sure to email Susan and we'll be sending out the webinar in about a week or two. Next week, uh, we have Paula Gillikin, I believe, with um, the North Carolina Coastal Reserve, and she'll be talking about two of the reserves in the system, Bermuda Island and the Rachel Carson Reserve, which has the wild horses. So you'll want to tune in for that next Tuesday at noon. Thanks.